Humans are obsessed with death and aging, even though most of them have already died. 93% to be exact. But the immortal jellyfish doesn't die. I mean, it can get eaten by sea turtles or sharks or apparently penguins, but as long as it can outswim the Grim Reaper, it can theoretically live forever. How does it do this? And why can't we? It didn't have to be this way. Humans could have been biologically immortal. Plenty of organisms are, or at least live much, much longer. There are Greenland sharks that are older than the United States. There is an aspen tree in Utah that predates the very first humans in North America. Charles Darwin and Steve Irwin may have owned the same tortoise. Its name was Harriet, and it was very cute. The first organisms to ever exist when Earth was just a primordial ooze likely did not age. But at some point in our evolution, we, or at least one of our ancestors, began to experience senescence. That's the scientific term for aging. It's also what the jelly fish does not have. Senescence loosely means that for each year a human adult is alive, they are more likely to die than the previous year. That's what aging is. But species that are biologically immortal have a flat death curve. They just kind of look both ways when they cross the street. The immortal jellyfish in particular does something really interesting and unique. Not only does it have a flat death curve, but when it reaches old age, it just starts over. They just Benjamin Button themselves over and over and over again. Ironically, the immortal jellyfish actually dies really fast in captivity. There's only one person who's managed to keep a colony alive, and that's Shin Kubota, a Japanese scientist who loves his jellyfish so much, he sings songs about them after every lecture. We must protect this man at all costs. Scientists think that understanding the immortal jellyfish might hold the key to life extension disease treatment, slowing aging, which is something humans have tried to do for literally thousands of years. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest surviving literary work, Gilgamesh searches for a plant of immortality. 2,000 years later, alchemists tried to create the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life. And 2,000 years after that, billionaires go on podcasts and talk about injecting themselves with young blood and taking rapamycin. Billionaires can't buy youth. Kings cannot command it to be so. Heck, Gilgamesh was a demigod, and even he couldn't have it. But why? Why did our ancestors begin to age? Why do we die? It's harder to answer this question than you might think. Scientists estimate that there may be as many as 300 theories of aging. That's a lot. That means if each theory of aging was a Game of Thrones episode, you would have to watch the entire series four times. But thankfully, most of these theories concern the how of aging. The why, we can actually say something about. It's hard not to think of aging as some kind of malfunction, like the jellyfish has figured out something that we haven't. But that's not exactly true. My grandfather lived to be 101 years old. To put that in perspective, when he was born, two-thirds of America still didn't have electricity. He was amazing. At 100 years old, he could still walk. He had his wits about him. Hell, he drove a car into his 90s. But the strangest thing happened as he got older. We talked every Tuesday, and every week, he would tell me how much he wanted to die. We, we, we'd joke about it. It wasn't like a sad thing. He was just ready to die. You know, his doctor told him he should walk every day to improve his health. And he's like, what for? I'm not trying to live longer. Sure, he was achy. He was losing his vision. But more than anything, he was just bored. He was tired. He missed my grandma. And he was living in Indiana, so that didn't help either. The most widely accepted model of aging, and the one I like the most, is antagonistic pleiotropy. These are big words, but the concept is actually simple and unbelievably elegant. If a gene does two things, and one of those things helps you in your reproductive years, and the other one hurts you later in your non-reproductive years, natural selection will happily select for that gene. It's like leaving your clothes in the dryer. You know they're gonna be wrinkly later, but right now, it feels good. For example, gene P53 prevents cancer in young people, but makes it harder to renew tissue in older people. You can think of antagonistic pleiotropy like steroids. Evolution selects for fitness and vigor while young, but the trade-off is aging and death. Sure, my grandfather got old, but he also served in World War II. He had a love affair with the heiress of the Moet Champagne fortune in France before meeting my grandmother, of course. He was a pianist in a jazz band. He played tennis. He traveled the world. He got old, but he was young. 
At the end of the Epic of Gilgamesh, a serpent steals the plant of immortality. Gilgamesh weeps, seeing his one chance at immortality disappear. But I think that serpent may have been doing him a favor. Why do we die? Well, in a very real, scientific way, we die so that we can be young. Death is not an accident, nor was it inevitable. It is, quite simply, a cost. A fee for this amazing chance to feel the earth under our feet and look up at the night sky in wonder. And we may envy the immortal jellyfish, but it will never, ever know this feeling.